When you solve a heat transfer problem in Fluent, you have to specify thermal boundary conditions for all flow boundaries and all walls. Flow boundaries are easy. Just go to the Thermal tab in the Boundary Conditions panel and enter the temperature. At inlets, this is obviously just the temperature of the fluid as it enters the domain. At outlets, the value you enter is the backflow temperature and Fluent will only use it if there's reverse flow and then only at parts of the boundary where reverse flow actually enters the domain. If there is no reverse flow, the backflow value will not have any effect on the solution, but it's usually a good idea to enter a reasonable value in case reverse flow occurs during part of the iterative process. Now let's look at the boundary conditions panel for a wall. The default condition for a wall is constant heat flux with a value of zero, which would mean there's no heat transfer through the wall. We call this an adiabatic boundary condition. If you want to have heat transfer, then you can enter a non-zero value for the heat flux, or you can set the wall temperature. The basic idea is that if you define the heat flux, then your CFD calculation will calculate what the wall temperature has to be in order to achieve that heat flux, or conversely, if you define the temperature, Fluent will calculate what the heat flux is for that temperature. Sometimes there might be uncertainty about conditions right at the wall, but if you know how the wall exchanges heat with the environment outside of the domain, you can use convection, radiation, or mixed conditions. In the convection BC, you enter the value for the free stream temperature and the heat transfer coefficient. These represent the temperature of the environment outside of the computational domain and the heat transfer coefficient between the wall and its environment. So basically, the heat flux through the wall is a function both of the inputs in the panel and the calculated wall temperature at the current iteration. The radiation boundary condition is similar, except now heat transfer between the wall and the environment occurs by means of radiation. And if you select mixed, then both convection and radiation are included. The other options are only used in special cases. Via system coupling is used for certain thermal fluid structure interaction problems, and via mapped interfaces is used with certain kinds of non-conformal mesh interfaces. If your model includes both solid zones and fluid zones, like the one here on the screen, then you are solving what is called a conjugate heat transfer problem. It's called conjugate heat transfer because at the wall, convection from the fluid to the wall is coupled to conduction from the wall into the solid or vice versa if the solid is warmer than the fluid. In conjugate heat transfer problems, when fluent first loads the mesh, it makes an identical copy of the wall of the solid. This copy is known as a shadow wall, so you can see here in the panel there's a wall coil and a wall coil shadow. One side of the wall and wall shadow pair is attached to the fluid zone, and the other side will be attached to the solid zone. You can see which one is which by looking in the adjacent cell zone field. For a conjugate heat transfer problem, the boundary condition used at the wall is the coupled boundary condition. This means that at every mesh face on a wall, the temperature at the corresponding mesh face on the shadow wall is identical, and the heat fluxes are equal and opposite. It is possible to break the thermal coupling between the wall and its shadow by selecting heat flux or temperature but there are few, if any, circumstances where it would be physically meaningful to do so, and it would also no longer be a conjugate heat transfer model because the heat transfer in the fluid would be independent of the heat transfer in the solid. One additional thing I want to talk about is energy sources. It's not unusual for heat transfer problems to make use of energy sources, for instance, to represent the heat generated by an electrical component. In the model on the screen now, the coil is made out of copper and it's heated by electrical resistance. To simplify the modeling, the heating is represented as a uniform volumetric energy source. To define this source, just open the cell zone conditions panel for the solid, go to the sources tab, enter one or more sources, and then enter values. The units of the source term are power per unit volume. So if you're using SI units, energy source terms usually have large values. When the value here is multiplied by the volume of the coil, 
the total energy source term turns out to be 2.9 megawatts. And remember, if you need to find the volume of your solid zone, you can use the volume integrals panel to do that. Even though this model only has an energy source in the solid, there can also be sources in the fluid. And while we've used a constant value in this problem, it is also possible to use profiles or user-defined functions or expressions to make the source term non-uniform and or a function of other solution variables. Before moving on to the next topic, I just want to summarize the main steps for setting thermal boundary conditions. At flow inlets and flow outlets, you have to define the temperature and the values at outlets only apply when reverse flow enters your domain. At walls, there are a number of different possibilities and you can choose the one that best matches your problem. If you have conjugate heat transfer, keep the setting of coupled for the thermal boundary condition on walls with shadows. And you also have the option to define volumetric energy sources in both solid cell zones and fluid cell zones.